Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Thursday, July 11th, 2019 Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Tom Boley and Greg Schnell. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show, and for our regulars, welcome back. Taking a look at the market action, we got more records. Dow Jones Industrial Average currently up 204 points to 27,064. The S&P 500 back over that 3,000 level, 3,001, up eight points. The NASDAQ rising also up 19 points back to 8221. And the Russell 2000 lagging once again, down six points to 1559, not participating. That has been a theme in 2019. The uh, 10 year Treasury yield beginning an uptrend. We talked about this. There was a positive divergence in play. We have started to see this uh, rebound in the yields. 10 year Treasury yield today up more than three basis points, 2.09%. Volatility index drifting lower, threatening the lows that was established a little over a week ago, back down a little over 1% today to 1286. Technology leading to the upside today, along with discretionary and financials. That's a good trio to be leading the market to the upside as we break through new records. Real estate lagging, but we got right to a key resistance area, testing the June highs before we have uh, seen some profit taking today in that group, down more than uh, 1% in real estate. Drug retailers and uh, healthcare providers really getting a lift today. Uh, both these groups up strongly, um, and both of these groups had been lagging for a while, but you can see that uh, since the beginning of June, we have started to see an uptrend, and today's move to the upside is continuing that uh, bullish bias in those areas. Railroads having a really strong day-to-day -day part of the transportation group. Of course, this has been the part of the transportation group that has been very strong the last couple of years. They've been this group's been showing tremendous leadership, uh, still waiting on the airlines and the truckers to follow suit. And then uh, individual stocks, best performer in the Dow today, United Health, and the best performer in the S&P 500 is Cigna, both of these healthcare providers. All right, uh, Greg, uh, you haven't been on the show in a while, but first of all, I want to thank you for coming in to, uh, to sub for Aaron today. Uh, what do you think of all these records going on? Hey, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out there trying to be bearish, but you know, when you're hitting new highs, the market's bullish and it's been that way for a while. The breadth keeps improving. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble finding anything to slow the roller coaster down. So. Yeah, it certainly doesn't hurt when you've got central bankers around the globe that are very dovish. Um, you know, yesterday we had uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell testifying in front of Congress and uh, essentially telling everybody they're going to lower rates. Um, and there's a 100% chance of that now at the end of this month. And of course, you know, central bankers around the world have been very dovish. So they, there's an old saying, you don't fight the Fed. And I think that really goes uh, right now. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, there was a comment on uh, by one of the um, market makers, I think it was Morgan Stanley, uh, somebody like that. Anyway, one of their commentary people had uh, a number and they estimate that over the next three months or something that there are 19 central banks around the world about to lower interest rates. Against that backdrop, that is just so bullish that you can't, um, you know, the, the feds are doing everything they can to keep this rally going. And so why would you try to take the other side of the trade? Yeah, and I know during uh, you know prior recessions, we see the the job growth really slow and even begin to turn down. We're not really seeing that. We saw last month's report a little slow, but then it picked right back up again this month. Record low unemployment and uh, and a cooperating Fed. I think that's a nirvana for stocks. But we got a special guest joining us today, Arthur Hill uh, from Stock Charts here, another senior technical analyst. Um, Art, what do you think about what's going on? And welcome to Market Watchers Live. Hey, Tom and Greg, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Well, I think it's just, uh, there's, I really don't follow or mark resistance levels when we're in an uptrend. And so the higher highs, you know, we're above the S&P 500 is above its 200 day, uh, 50 days above the 200 day, and it's at new highs. So the path of least resistance has been up and it remains up. So uh, you know, maybe we're short term overbought is about the worst we can say uh, right now. But the trend is clearly up and we're in a bull market. Yeah, it's hard to hard to argue with all of that. I agree. I mean, when you got you're breaking out the new highs, I just call it blue sky territory. I mean, you know, where does the sky end? You know, I mean, yes, it's hard to, to pick a point. I mean, if you're looking to get out of the market or to trade and you're looking for targets, well, when you've got stocks and, and major indices moving to all time highs, it's really difficult unless you've got a measurement on a pattern. It's difficult to find a spot uh, where you'd be comfortable selling. 
All right. Uh, well, Arthur is, has agreed to join us today because we are going to have a panel discussion in a bit. But before we get into that, I'm going to ask you to hang around there a little bit, uh, Arthur, if you don't mind. Um, we do have an upcoming schedule. You can see on your screen, we've got Martin Pring joining Martin, uh, Market Watchers Live. That's going to be an exciting show. And of course, Julius DeCampenar returning. July 22nd to July 26th, mark your calendars, Relative Strength Week. I think that this is a very, very important topic. I know Greg and Arthur would agree with me and just about everyone we've had here on Market Watchers Live, anybody following technical analysis knows the importance of relative strength. And uh, so we've dedicated a week to it and check out those uh, hosts and our co-hosts and guests that we're going to have uh, on the show that week on those shows. I think it's going to be a really fantastic week. So make sure that you mark your calendar and you join us for that. As far as today, though, uh, we've got a number of things going up. First thing, membership has its benefits. We want to talk a little bit. Uh, you know, I think maybe Arthur and Greg and I take uh, take things for granted a little bit because we've been here at Stock Charts for so long. But we're going to give you a little bit of a look into the differences between being a member and a non-member at Stock Charts. I think you're going to find it eye-opening. We'll get into the 10 in 10 NVIDIA. NVDA will be your first symbol. Uh, check that chart out. See what you think. See if you agree with me later in the show. I'll go through that one along with nine others. Then we'll have a Talking Technically segment. It's Thursday. We always do these Talking Technically segments. Today, uh, you'll get a little piece of advice from Julius. So stick around for that. And then we're going to end the show with technical scans. So Greg and I will go over a couple of technical scans for you to consider. All right. Uh, well, that is it for the agenda. So we might as well just jump right in here. Uh, first, we're going to start with some economic reports. And you can see on your screen a few, only three out, but they were all three pretty big ones. Initial jobless claims came in better than expected, 209,000 versus 220,000. And then we had June CPI and June core CPI, both one-tenth of a percent above expectations. And of course, that's one thing that the Fed uh, watches very closely. So we'll certainly want to see if that's the start of a trend or if it's just an aberration uh, moving up a little bit higher than expectations. On your screen, I have the 10-year Treasury yield, and I'm going to update this. And I know this is a little different than what I normally show for the 10-year Treasury yield, but this is something I've talked about quite a bit. Uh, Tony Dwyer, who was on the show yesterday, uh, touched on this a bit as well. But when you look at the 10-year Treasury yield, this is the last 10 years during the bull market. When the 10-year Treasury yield is dropping, as it was in 20, you know, 2009 through 2012, and then again, 2014 through 2016, and then again, over the last, uh, I don't know, maybe nine, 10 months or so. Anytime you've got the 10-year Treasury yield dropping, money is rotating into treasuries, and that, uh, is, that's money that can't go into equities. Um, if you're looking at, you know, allocating uh, a portfolio and strategizing, money that goes into treasuries can't go into equities. It's when the treasury yields start moving up. That's money coming out of treasuries. That's what sends the, the yields higher. And that normally also sends the stock market much higher. And you can see on the screen how much in very short periods of time the stock market can go higher when the 10-year treasury yield is in an uptrend. Now, we've been downtrending. I certainly wouldn't call the last three or four days an uptrend, but it could be the start of one. What I pointed out with these pink, uh, these pink vertical lines dotted lines is that we broke out on the S&P 500 here, also back here after the consolidation period, and right now after the consolidation period. In each of these three instances, we broke out on the S&P 500 before we started moving higher on the 10-year Treasury yield or as we were moving higher. So I think it's really important that you know we haven't gone up much over the past nine, 10 months since the high back in September, but we have managed to move a little bit higher with the 10-year Treasury yield moving lower. What might happen if the 10-year Treasury yield starts to rise from here? That's something I think is worth pondering. Another thing worth pondering is the start of earnings season, and we do have a number of earnings reports out. Um, last night, smaller companies, mostly you know one to $2 billion companies, Price Smart, Bed Bath & Beyond, and AAR Corp, and Airline, all three of those came in ahead of expectations on the bottom line. This morning, though, I thought was the best report of all Delta Airlines coming out, beating, uh, not only beating on the bottom line, also beating on the top line and producing their highest revenue uh, quarter in their history. Really good report out of Delta Airlines. And that is a, a stock 
that I actually have talked about. I, I mentioned in my blog yesterday, if you were going to get into airlines, if they do break out, Delta has been one of the leaders. And I'm going to show you that chart in just a minute. But first, before I get into that, like that TNX chart, the 10-year treasury yield chart that I just showed you, I want you to look at the performance of transports versus utilities. This is another chart that I mentioned yesterday during the show. Uh, if you were here, it's a refresher. If not, maybe it'll be a new chart for you to consider. But I discussed it with Tony Dwyer. And uh, when you see transports outperforming utilities, that normally happens when the 10-year treasury yield is rising. It's an indication of uh, strong economic growth or the anticipation of stre uh, strengthening economic growth. When the transports are doing well relative to the utilities, that's when we get the big moves in the S&P 500. When transports are underperforming, that's when we tend to see this sideways consolidation, not a whole lot of action to the upside. So I think it's really important when you look at this to realize that if the transports start to move, and we've had railroads performing very well for the last few years, but the, it's been the airlines and the truckers, especially the truckers that have struggled during this period of sideways consolidation on the S&P 500. But I'm gonna zero in first on airlines. Airlines, if you look at this, and I'm gonna make sure I got the update because we're getting close to a very significant multi-month breakout. We're about to set a new 2019 high on the airlines group. And when you consider that Delta, um, right here, you can see Delta threatening a breakout. And look at the relative strength on Delta since early in the year. So almost since the beginning of 2019, Delta has been outperforming the airlines. But you really don't see it much in the price chart or as much because airlines on a relative basis have been moving lower versus the S&P 500. So you've got a really strong company, but in a group that's holding it back. Well, if we get that breakout in the airlines, I believe Delta is one of the stocks that we want to keep in mind uh, to possibly trade as we move down the, uh, the road. As I mentioned, Delta did beat on their top line 12.54 billion in revenues, the market expecting 12.49, beat on the bottom line 235 versus uh, 228. And as I mentioned, those revenues were a record quarter for Delta Airlines. So that stock looking up and also, you know, if we can get liftoff no pun intended, in the airlines, I think that uh, Delta could be a, a really nice performer as we move forward. A couple other stocks I wanted to mention. One was um, Fastenal, F-A-S-T. If we pull this up on a relative chart, first of all, the, the $30 level, I think, is really important area. That was resistance for a number of months in 2018. We broke above it, and that has served as support in 2019. We opened below 30 today. Heavy volume, I want to see where this stock closes, but when you look at it, the overall group is weakening, and this stock, which had been a pretty good performer, is now down at about a three-month relative low to the group, and like I said, the group, as you can see, moving to a new 52-week low. So the last thing I want to see on a stock like this is a heavy volume breakdown to the downside, something to consider. All right, let's move on to the scooter movers, and of course, I love to look at the scooter movers, and I'm going to go in here first and take a look. And one of the stocks I mentioned at the uh, top of the show, United Health. Look at this over here on the large cap scooter list, rising 23 points, trailing only Cigna. The other stock I mentioned at the top of the show, these are two large caps really getting a big lift here today. And if we look at the um, chart on UNH, I want you to see first the scooter breaking above 50 for the first time since back in February. Also, if you notice, since the big decline back late February, early March, these reaction highs have struggled close to the, the mid 250s. We are now at 260 and look at the volume picking up. Also, two of the big calculations in the scooter score, your rate of change, the 125 day rate of change is 30% of the calculation. Rate of change 20 days is 15%. So these two are almost 50% of the calculation and check out what's going on. They're both rising, and that's why UNH is rising relative to its peers, and it's also why it is our scooter mover of the day. Okay, and I'm going to take over with a better screen than that, actually. It just pops up to that one. <laughs> um, that is a stag party on a golf course, uh, 20, uh, <laughs> 20 Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep. 
So um, I'm going to go through the upgrades and downgrades today, and I've got three of them to share with you, uh, three upgrades to share with you. And I know Tom's going to talk about NVIDIA a little bit later on today in 10 and 10, but I'll start and just show you why. Um, this one's an interesting upgrade from uh, Cassent Cass Securities from hold to buy, and uh, they've got a target of 190, which puts it right in about here. Now, this chart looks okay to me. I think uh, the scooter mover, the scooter is starting to turn up, and I like this when it pushes up, pulls back, and then restarts. That's a really nice indication that there's more interest showing up, doesn't just kind of go up and fail. And the other thing that we see here is the daily PPO is starting to move above zero, which, you know, normally is associated with a pretty good uptrend. Now, let's go look at the weekly because I think that's a little bit better clue for us. What I want to talk about on the weekly is um, you just see this big downtrend here and also this big downtrend on momentum and I like it when the momentum downtrend also breaks in a timely fashion with this full stochastic about to turn up. So that's one I really like. Um, now we have DVAX and this one is upgraded uh, from Cantor Fitzgerald from neutral to overweight. So this thing is down here uh, drilling the chart at about 388 this morning and they've got a target of $20 on the stock and we wow. kind of think that yeah, can uh, five dollars to be a good target? So anyway, twenty dollars is a pretty aggressive price target way up here. Yeah, how about four fifty, right, Greg? <laughs> four fifty looks, <laughs> you know, you're still up. Uh, Doable. So three fifty, yeah, you're up twenty percent. Uh, anyway, that one's got, uh, let's just say, a bit of optimism associated with it. And then we have our good friends in Weight Watchers, and this one's obviously been losing weight for a while, um, starting to try and gain weight here, but they put an outstanding price target on it of about $24 or something, which is pretty much where we're at and not really a stretch. And it's, um, yeah, so uh, we'll just leave that one alone. But in general, what, the, what did the, you got to say what the rating went from? Come on. <laughs> the weighting went from neutral to overweight and we're just thinking that it's always overweight so anyway um so that, that one's a tough one um i want to cover off three on the downgrade side before i run out of time and we're going to cover off um uh, alcoa um and what you can see here is they've decided that this should be downgraded and i'm um from buy to neutral by Deutsche Bank. And I'm thinking they're a little late to the party on that one. And they've taken their target from 35 to 23. It's at 22.50. So that one doesn't really work for me. Um, this HLNE chart is a little bit better, Hamilton Lane. And one of the things, um, they were downgrading it. And I think the most important thing here is it has had a huge climb. I'm not sure I'd be ready to call the top on something that's still outperforming on relative strength and, and everything is still working. Scooter ranking still up in the top corner. That's my black line here. And everything looks so strong. Uh, it just seems like an aggressive downgrade with no real need for it at this time. Now, the other ones to step on the sell button were uh, Credit Suisse went through the whole transportation sector and downgraded all of the trucking companies. And so Werner is one of the ones they've downgraded. They also downgraded Schneider National and, um, oh, well, I got Schneider Steel. Um, my mistake. And what was the other one I had? Yeah, SNDR. I just want to quickly show these. So they're downgrading all of these. And I, just to say, I think it's a little bit late to the party on the downgrades. And then uh, JB Hunt, which is obviously one of the biggest trucking firms in, in America. Um, you know, th this seems late. And again, as Tom mentioned, if we're going to start to see any sort of change in the transportation and trucking starts to pick up here, th this just seems a little bit late to the party. So with that, I'll flip it back. Yeah, there's the uh, upgrades and downgrades for you. And uh, we're going to be right back in just a minute with a really special panel. I'm glad uh, Arthur's joining. You're going to want to stick around for this.
am uh, especially happy today to have a couple of my colleagues at Stock Charts, uh, both Greg Schnell and Arthur Hill, two senior technical analysts, joining me today for a special panel discussion. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, about the membership here at Stock Charts. Greg is going to uh, he has uh, volunteered to be a member during this panel discussion, and we have volunteered Arthur to be a non-member. <laughs> So this is this ought to be really interesting. We're going to go over some of the things that, uh, you know, really sets membership apart here at Stock Charts and at the same time gives you uh, a lot of uh, the, the ways that we use Stock Charts. So I think it'll be very educational at the same time, um, you know, for the for some of you maybe that are non-members, uh, maybe give you some some reasons to consider taking out a free trial and uh, learning what Greg and, and Arthur and I did a long time ago, which is that. Uh, I don't know about you two guys, but I couldn't imagine life right now without stock charts trying to do my my trading and my investing. Um, so I guess maybe first question is just, could you? How would you? How would you go on uh, without your stock charts account? Well, it's interesting that you say you volunteered me for the taking the other side of this trade, so to speak, because I am looking at the free side and I'm seeing all the stuff well that I don't have I don't have access to my chart list I don't have access to my scans uh, there's still a lot of information I'm not saying it's you know there's nothing out there but but there's really the, it's a level up when you get a membership it has some serious benefits and when I'm starting off on the market um, I'm looking at the market summary page and this is all available I'm taking the free side all right this is all available to anybody uh, that comes to the stock charts website. But this is a great way to just get an overview of what the market is doing and you get data that's updated via bats. So it is semi real time, so to speak. Uh, but I can see how the major markets are doing. I can scroll down and see the major indexes and I've got this set to ETFs. I can see the sectors at one glance and what's really nifty is you can click on one of these names to see the chart over there on the left. So I really like that aspect of it. Uh, but I think Greg probably has a niftier way to look at things when he's logged in. Yeah, and I, I want to just add before we bring Greg in about this uh, to talk about this. Um, first of all, you mentioned a couple of great points. The, the free membership, the free information is still very, very solid. I mean, you can still get a lot of great information, but I'm now going to bring in the member uh, Greg Schnell. And uh, Greg, how, how are things in Canada with your membership? <laughs> well, they're a lot better for me. Uh, so first of all, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of customized charts. So that matters a lot to me. But one of the things that always happens for the Canadians, like a lot of the the site information here, um, you know, we quickly see top 10 S&P 500, but I can drop down and get my TSX all from my member dashboard. Um, I can click in on here and just see how the, the TSX is doing today. And I get all my custom intraday views. Uh, so just for gallery, just for this particular style of chart, I can go in here and have my own specific chart settings for all of these. And as you can see, we're waiting for the TSX to do what the S&P and Dow have just done, and that is break out to new highs. So with all of that going on, uh, you know, this, this is just an instant, uh, quick way to get going. Um, Art, Arthur just showed you the market view, but I think a lot of the things that I have um, advantage to, so as an example, let's just say um, whatever, the S&P 500 stocks, and here's a candle glance for the top 10 today, and I click on it. Well, I don't get the default candle glance. I get what I like to see, and that is that I've made a, my own PPO indicator show up at the bottom and to me weekly ppo is probably one of the biggest things i'm interested in and you know here's a ppo on micron going sideways pull back bounce up to the near zero pull back and now looks like it's ready to resume just as it's breaking above the 10 and 40 week moving averages full stochastic moving above 50 like this is just exactly the kind of thing i want to see on a quick update and that's not going to show on the default setting so i think you get two indicators in, pl in place of one one as well uh, yeah. on the normal candle glance on the free candle glance you just get one indicator yeah that would drive me crazy and so you can't get weekly so yeah 
uh, the, the, to me, uh, and again, I'm a big weekly investor. I really don't uh, day trade. But you know, here's Nvidia with that nice little downslope I mentioned earlier. When this downtrend in momentum breaks and starts to turn to the upside, and we're seeing, you know, a group of the semiconductors all start to move here, this just looks like a place to get. Um, on board with a lot of things and I would much rather have my settings and the way I like to look at the world rather than just kind of a default setting. So that's probably the single most important thing for me. Um, and the ability to have your own dashboard designed the way you like it. So you have, you know, whatever set up here. And I know Tom has another layer of indicators down here. But for me, I go in and I grab my scans first thing in the morning. Uh, I've got all of these alerts that fire off mail to me every day. And, you know, gold miners, uh, we, we've had gold on the move lately. So this one's just fired off again this morning. And every day I get new updates coming into my mail that I can select. Uh, I just can't imagine not trying to do that. Um, that would make it very difficult for me. So Yeah, and I, you mentioned the dashboard, and I'm going to go ahead and just show this uh, as well, because this is really important to me. I would have said prior to the new dashboard, I would have said probably scanning and chart lists were two of the key features for me because it helps me to organize. But chart lists help me to organize within a chart list. The dashboard really gives me the big picture um, uh, organization of everything, just about everything that I do at stock charts. Like you mentioned, you've got, uh, you know, the scans, um, which uh, on this account, um, you know, I've got everything set up. I've got the additional data panels, the scans, alerts, and then also the chart list panels. And you get that by simply uh, clicking on this little gear. Uh, over in the upper right hand corner, you can customize what you see. And one of the neat features is to have your chart list down here as a panel. So a couple of the really strong areas or a couple of strong chart lists uh, or strong earnings chart list, I should say, uh, I use because I can quickly sort and see what's moving in my watch list and what's not moving um, and what's moving in the wrong direction. Also, I have a relative strength. So um, I sometimes will go to the sector summary, but it's also uh, very quick for me to see that healthcare providers are outperforming the S&P 500. So I've got a chart list of all the industry groups. So I can quickly see healthcare railroads both leading to the upside on a relative basis. So there's a lot you can do in customization and organization. Um, you know, and you all were talking about how you start your day. I really start my day mostly from the dashboard because I can quickly see the way I have mine set up, uh, what's leading the market, and then also among the, the watch list stocks that I have, which ones are moving, which ones aren't. I do the, you know, uh, I, I look at the scooter mover of the day every day here on the show, but this having these technical rankings set up, small cap, mid cap, and large cap, uh, top up, it's telling me very quickly some individual stocks that I might want to zero in on that maybe aren't on my strong earnings chart list. So there's a lot of great information right here from the dashboard. Um, and while chart lists and scanning are two powerful tools within stock charts, this kind of summarizes and organizes all of it and brings it all together, which I think is uh, a pretty amazing. It really is, yeah. I, just the ability, I can't imagine starting from a, a blank template every morning. I don't know how I would do it actually, so. Well, one other thing that the three of us have in common at uh, stock charts, uh, even including the non-member Arthur, um, is we, we do a lot of commentary. And so the differences in the commentary from a, a free subscription versus a paid subscription is pretty substantial. Now, I know, Arthur, you write a blog. Uh, you know, you have your regular blog. Uh, Greg, you do the same. I do the same. We have our shows. Why don't the two of you as members and non-members uh, discuss a little bit about what you see and what you don't see? Okay, well, let's take a look at that because you can really tell right off the bat which articles are free and which are for paid subscribers. Uh, first of all, if you're a free member, you're going to get some pop-ups coming up. Uh, so you're going to have to wade through some ads. The articles with the white background there are open to everybody, but the ones with a green shading, like John Murphy, legendary technical analyst, uh, those are behind the paywall, so you need to be a member to read John Murphy. You also need to be a member to read Martin Pring. And this there's some guy named Arthur Hill as well. You need to be a member uh, to read his articles and analysis. There's Martin Pring's uh, Market Roundup. 
And he's talking about three sectors and five industry groups poised to move higher. And I'd sure like to know which ones these are, but I don't, I'm not a member, so I can't really uh, look at those. One thing that you can do as a free user is you can always go to Stock Charts TV, which I guess you'll know about because you're watching it right now. Uh, but there's a whole list of shows down there below that you can watch as well as recordings. You look over here to the right, you can see the link for the recording. There's Greg's Market Buzz, and you can see Chartwise Women. That's our new show with Aaron and Mrs. McGonigal. Uh, and we also have, there you can see the Dwyer uh, Macro Strategy. So a lot of good stuff on there for free users as well. But Greg, what does it look like behind the paywall? The the one thing that I think is most important, like, you know, a lot of people pay for content around the internet. And one of the things that shocks me the most is that the volume of content on stock charts, like all of these different blogs are set up. And then if you're uh, uh, a member, you have the ability to get down into these three articles down here. And we'll just cover off Martin Pring's market roundup. So it just pops into his own channel. You can go down through here if you're a, an avid fan of Martin. And again, jumping in to look at these different things. Martin tries to summarize, summarize what he's talking about at the top. And then as he goes through, and I don't know why I didn't get my charts to load it, but probably just uh, an issue on um, Canadian whatever. bandwidth. Could be Canadian bandwidth, yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a tariff on it or something. I don't know. So, but, hey, Greg, he's just bitter because he's a non-member right now. Yeah. yeah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that when you're when you're um, a stock charts member and you're working through here, you you get the ability to get chart packs and stuff from Arthur. Um, you know, it's this subscription stuff that you can set up um, that, that you sign into and you can ask for. Um, obviously, I get Canadian real-time data, U.S. real-time data. So if I'm going to be trading my account or using my account to make investments, you know, it helps to have real-time data if you want that. But, but that's also an opportunity to go from 20-minute uh, delayed data into data that uh, is up to the minute. So you know, there's just so many things. And like Arthur has gone through here and set up all of these chart packs. And if I go, I mean, I, I went and grabbed his chart packs. It's like, why would I go set up ETF chart lists and all that kind of stuff when Arthur has everything all, all built up. So there's so many different tools. And again, um, these are chart lists that I have and I, I have reams of them, but here's Arthur Hill's ETF master list one and two. And there's a whole bunch of other Arthur Hill things in my uh, Arthur Hill's market in a nutshell chart pack. So Arthur's gone through and created all of this work. You don't have to do anything. It's all just sitting here waiting for you to go uh, pull down. So there's so many things that I think from a, a member perspective and just pulling down, you know, somebody like Arthur, how many years have you been on the website, Arthur? Uh, many, many. I came, uh, I think I was before Chip. <laughs> <laughs> You're the founder. Yeah. It, it, a lot of people don't really know this, but you know, no, just kidding. I came, uh, I came after Chip and Kelly and, um, yeah, I was one of the first, uh, in the beginning. Yeah. So it's uh, 20, 25 years or 20, 20 years, 20, 20 plus years. indeed. Yeah. And so, uh, all of these things are sitting here that, that, you know, a professional uh, market technician is, has set up for you to just go pull down and all of the chart settings are there and then you can click on them and adjust them any way you like. So I can't imagine, you know, being able to just borrow somebody's work for the price of a membership. That is rocket ship stuff. Uh, yeah, and those are like templates that you can use and apply. You can put other symbols in there as well. Yeah, for uh, sure. For instance, that's showing the S&P 1500 high-low percent but you could just change out the symbol to get the S&P 500 or small cap high low percent. Yeah. So if you change it to SML there, you would get small cap high low percent. And then you could save that to your chart list. So you could track small cap breadth that way. And I also uh, want to mention too, uh, we haven't really talked about chart school, but you did mention you kind of started back at the very beginning, Arthur, and you are primarily responsible for a lot of the work that was done in the chart school. And I'm sure a lot of the members, both paid and free members, have used that chart school to a large degree. So certainly thanks for all your contributions there, no doubt. Thank That's you. an amazing level of stuff that he has 
he has worked on diligently to to it's build an that encyclopedia. out. It, it truly is an encyclopedia of technical analysis. I think you've done a fa fabulous job there. Yeah. Um, and I would just maybe throw one more thing in there about the commentary because uh, I really, um, you know, I'm fairly self-taught. I'd like to think I am, but I I did read John Murphy's books, and one of the things that's really cool as a member is being able to get constant updates from John Murphy. I mean, if you, anyone who's followed his work and uh, the way he looks at the market and uh, comparing different um, markets and asset classes and using those ratios and so forth, that's where I kind of, you know, got my start in that area was uh, following a lot of John Murphy's work. So uh, we, we was, all went through technical analysis of the financial markets in the beginning, didn't we? Yep. Yeah. You know, and, and intermarket analysis as well, his classic book. Yep. And I, I still refer to them occasionally. Uh, they sit on my bookshelf. So, um, all right. Well, we are going to move on into uh, technical indicators and customizing charts and some of the features there. Um, I would turn it over to you, Arthur, but I don't think you can do anything. So, uh, I'm <laughs> well, kidding. I'm going to try here. <laughs> Take it away. So, uh, yeah. So if you're just a, a, a non-member and you're coming to stock charts, sure, you can pull up a chart of, say, QQQ, and you can put on a maximum of three overlays. So here I've got a moving average, two moving averages in volume by price, but that's the most I can put on. And I can put on three indicators as well. Uh, but that's about all I can do. There's an annotate button, and I can definitely click that button, and I can do some annotating if I want to draw a couple of trend lines here. But, you know, to save it, I would have to do a screenshot. And what's really nice is after a while, you start building up a list of favorites, and you put them in a chart list, and you annotate them, and then you save your annotations. But I cannot save my annotations. And I work a lot with annotations because they tell me what I was seeing back in the past uh, and how it worked out because I don't change my annotations as I go forward. I leave them there because I know, so that kind of like is a track record of, you know, whether I, whether I was right or wrong back then. And it's a learning experience because it tells you where you were wrong when you can annotate and save it. And then another thing, you know, the size is fixed. You can't do a custom size here. Uh, so it is limited in what you can do here. And I think Greg Schnell can show you a lot more here when he takes over from a member standpoint. Yeah. The, I mean, for the, the tool, it's just not fair. <laughs> it's really, um, so crazy. So one of the things about candle glance tools, um, you, you can customize them all, but down here in the bottom left is a chart styles button that members don't have access to. And you can have all of these different settings of charts. So here's an Alexander Elder daily chart. And, um, well, I obviously named it that and didn't change it. Um, but in, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, but down at the bottom here is, is there you go. There's elder. There's Elders Weekly. And what you see here is it's got the red, green, blue. And I love that. I mean, if you have read his Trading for a Living book and understand what he's basically saying, the weekly has to line up with the daily and the, just color code it so it all works. These settings are all sitting here. And, and of course, you can change whole entire chart lists to have that. So on the side here, I have all of these little buttons and this button here this is my go-to chart for weekly. And if you've watched uh, the market buzz or my weekend market reviews of Canada and U.S. markets, you'll see, uh, you know, this is my favorite setting. And I've got a scooter ranking up here. And what I like the scooter ranking for is it's more responsive to help me see when a stock is really starting to outperform an index. And, you know, the CVS Health, basically it went years without outperforming briefly started to and turned back right away. Well, now it's actually perking back up. And, it, you know, do you want to play in that space? That's a good question. But as Tom pointed out this morning, the healthcare is starting to break out. So maybe this is an area to start to lean into. But really quick, I have, you know, all of these different chart settings and notice how they're full width. They're um, taken over the whole page. I can add the zoom panels over here on the right. I have a MACD of a 50, 109, which is, you know, normally it's 12, 26 and nine, but this is on a 60 minute chart. And then I have a really long-term MACD. And essentially what I want to know is, is the stock starting to, to build a long-term uptrend? And you'll start to see this go, I think if I go pick a 
a Canadian stock like uh, CNQ, as an example, this stock was really underperforming for a long period. It, it basically started to outperform, pulled back a bit, and now it's starting to perform again. You know, can this start to work higher? Great question. We don't have the answer. But the, the whole idea that I'm starting to, I have multiple different levels or multiple time frames of momentum I can check out. Um, that's fabulous for me. And again, PPO and MACD, this is the histogram. I really like the line on the PPO. And again, on a weekly chart, um, a PPO is percentage price movement, MACD is price movement. And so a chart like Amazon will will have an extreme MACD number compared to something like CNQ. And then uh, the difference would be if I did it in percentage, both of them could get 10 or 15% on a weekly chart. So all of that is available. Now, again, I have a default setup for full width. I have a default setup for um, writing my articles because they have to be a narrower chart. So all of these are just one click and they're set up and ready to rock. Uh, Plus, Greg, you can you can go five years, longer than five years. I can only go five years and yeah. I can't do monthlies. That would, um, yeah. And I do monthlies all the time. I think for most people reading my articles or watching my stuff. Yeah, you're my, doing some long charts. Yeah, in all of my um, chart lists. So, and this is just, these are all of my industry chart lists that I have set up and whatever. Arthur wrote an article about marijuana stocks. Well, I have 90 marijuana stocks all listed together in here. And, you know, if I want to, if all of a sudden, whatever, healthcare starting to break out. So I've got Healthcare Canada. I don't have Healthcare US. I could just quickly go set one up. It wouldn't take very much, but I have all of these broken out any way I want to see them. And, uh, you know, for, I just can't put those on your members dashboard. Yeah. And I just can't imagine if oil is starting to break out and I, I don't know which oil stock to start going to, you know, which ones are the high movers. I've got them all grouped together so I can quickly go rank them by either SCTR, the scooter ranking or rank them by, um, dividend rank them by full stochastic turning up PPO turning up anything I want. So just so much more flexibility. It's, and again, you know, down here, I have all 50 of my chart styles used. And when, when you go through all of these, like Pring's Nirvana Weekly, Martin loves this chart setup, and it, it really is helpful. So, you know, I just changed from my work to Earth or to Martin's work that quick. That's, that's just awesome. Like two, <laughs> two questions. One question for you, Greg. Number one, what, what would happen if you had to go back to th using just three overlays and three indicators? Well, I'd be naked. I just couldn't trade. Like, I literally don't think about the market. Um, like, to me, a lot of it is the industry movement. So I really need to have all my chart list set up so I can see movement in the industry. Then I want to go find the strongest stock in the sector. Um, I want to find the sectors that are the strongest. Obviously, it's been technology for 10 years. But, um, you know, if you're a commodity trader, you know, the gold trade here just a month ago, um, you know, I was able to jump in very quickly on the first morning. And I think that trade I pulled 40% out of um, in in three or four weeks. If I didn't have everything all set up, I'd be fumbling around trying to find the trade I want. By the time I get in, I've missed the, the move. And, you know, I... So if you're a commodity trader, you're going to be in and out of these things. Those are not long-term holds. Um, you know, you have to decide how you're going to trade something. But for me, the biggest issue is making sure that I can, you know, if, if all of a sudden the financials are starting to break out, I just go to my financials chart and I pull them all up and I pick what I want. If I see rare earth metals are starting to break out, I go grab that chart list. If I see it's gold, if I see it's whatever software, I just jump into those spaces and start to see the charts. Now, the one thing that we do with the scooter ranking is we only give you the top 10 as a free um a free component as a member you get to see them all and i find two of the most important areas for me typically um and i did this on my uh, market buzz yesterday was just went through scooter rankings and you know a simple scan for scooters between 60 and 80 um, that are starting to turn up two different ways to look at that i, I just can't imagine not being able to go in and grab you know, that sort of information at the click of a button, that is just so helpful for me to find the moves I want. All right, well, Arthur, we're gonna talk about scooters here in just a minute, but first, 
you know, we were talking about the time frames and the limitations that you have as a free member, not being able to use the long-term charts, the monthly and so forth. Are there any restrictions as far as the short term, like a uh, minute hourly? I mean, can you use all those charts? No, uh, I cannot use minute or hourly uh, charts. Um, so I would be handicapped in that regard. Uh, personally, I don't use intraday charts uh, anymore, but guys, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to log into my account and show you <laughs> what I have to see. It just, it just wasn't working. And, and what I like to do is I like to plot these special breath indicators that we have. And, you know, I've got the big six sectors and I've got the high low percent indicators. So I can see which sectors are creating the most highs. And you can see it's XLK technology. Healthcare is not doing so great. Finance is perking up. Consumer services is communication services is perking up. So it looks like technology healthcare, uh, finance, and communication services are starting to perk up. And I can see that all on one chart by getting all those indicators on. Whereas if I'm not a member, I can only put three indicators on. So um, sorry for that lapse there, but I just couldn't <laughs> handle it. I thought you could make it 30 minutes. Come on, Arthur. Yeah, I couldn't make it 30 minutes. Um, but, you know, here I am on the free... Um, one again, and there's the period setting. You get daily and weekly. Uh, so if you know you want to get a 60-minute chart because you see a setup maybe brewing on the daily chart, and you want to hone in on the 60-minute to really fine-tune your timing, which is fine, then you can do that uh, if you have a membership. Well, and the other thing I like, um, I use a different background for each thing. So I have a daily background, a weekly background, a 60 minute background, uh, you know, monthlies. So whenever I'm moving through my charts, they always show differently for each background. So I don't accidentally mistake when I'm looking at weeklies or dailies or whatever. You, it's, it's a very quick thing to have different color backgrounds and stuff. All, All right. preset. All right. Um, We're going to move on to our final area of this discussion. And of course, stock charts, uh, one of the exclusive features and tools here at stock charts is the stock charts technical rank, the uh, scooters, S-C-T-R-S, -S, the scooters. We talk about it a lot here on Market Watchers Live. And another area is the RRG charts. Of course, we have Julius DeCampinar, who is the founder of the RRG uh, charts, and he comes on the show quite a bit. We refer to the RRG quite a bit. Um, these are two exclusive features here at stock charts. How does that, how is that impacted as far as being a member versus a non-member? As a non-member, what, what can you see or what can you use, Arthur? Well, I love to see rankings. I like to see stocks ranked uh, by a particular indicator. Uh, and two of them that do the relative strength would be our scooters and the RRG charts. So here I am on our scooters page. And you can still access this page. Here, there's the charts and tools page. And if you go over to the right, then you will see ads, of course. Um, they're the member tools, uh, but there are some reports. Up and I can, pardon? Up a little bit farther is the scooter report. Yeah. Oh, there. thank you very much. There's the scooter report. And so I get 10. Uh, so I can't see where the other ones are. I can do a sort, uh, but I'm only sorting the top 10. So that really doesn't help me as far as, you know, finding stocks that are maybe crossing that 70 level to move into the top third of the scooter range and showing, you know, probably a renewed uh, or moving into the leadership group. Uh, with the RRG here, uh, what I can't see is I've got to move this. There we go. Uh, this is the basic RRG. And RRG was made for rotation, especially sector rotation. And when Greg takes the screen, he's going to show you an RRG doing the sector rotation. This is just a basic RRG chart. And I can, you know, I can do a little movement, but you can see I'm limited in the symbols that are put on. And if I want to put in my own symbols, I can't do it. And if I did, then I could see which ones are rotating, improving, leading, weakening, and lagging, and I can easily isolate the leading and lagging sectors and stocks. 
So Greg, I'll turn it over to you to show it how to do it. Okay, so one of the things that happens um, on the, well, let me just go quickly here. On the dashboard, as an example, you've got everything all set up. And, and with the dashboard, uh, one of the options down here is the RRG. So you just go grab it. It shows you the top 10 stocks and which ones, you know, what's starting to move up. So here we see Pfizer, um, Bristol Myers, and CVS. What do they have in common? Well, they're all in healthcare, but they're all just coming out of the improving and heading into the leading. Now, that's very nice. I could also check on those on a weekly chart on a daily basis, and I can just hit update. So I can see them in the time frames I want to see them. Here's uh, Microsoft and Nvidia, or sorry, Micron and Nvidia way over here already. And what could happen with Nvidia is it can literally circle on the right hand side of this chart, basically saying that it's uh, the relative strength continues to outperform the center of the grid. And in this case, it's the benchmark, which is S&P. But I could change that to be NASDAQ as an example. Uh, you know, I could change it to be uh, CompQ, whatever I want. I can set up any benchmark I want. I can use cash. I can use the treasury, um, anything in there. And then from that, there's also groups that you can check on and you can go see different members of all of these. I mean, this you know, Julius has built out this list. He's made our life so easy. You just go in and grab the U.S. industries and it's going to help show you. And you can toggle on and off ones that you don't want to know. So you could just toggle off anything in the red here and, and just focus on the green. We and can the table ranking at the bottom is really good too. Yeah. Like just uh, all of this is laid There's up. your top stocks. Yeah. yeah. So uh, our how, groups, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, top groups. But we can, you know, again, here's the the XLY members and we can go bring it up here and he's built us a nice list and we could just very quickly see everything that's in the top right hand corner on a weekly chart. We can zoom in, we can uh, change the dates here so we can just run the slider and watch how these rotate. There's so many tools I have on RRG and obviously um, Julius does a great job of getting these to, um, you know, that you can adjust the tail length just by dragging this. There's just so much customization that you can set up. And, and you know, if, if you're not, if you haven't used relative strength, Julius's tool is intuitive in terms of, you know, you want to see them going bottom left to top right. And as they start to break out, this is a great place on the chart just to keep looking for them. And even when they get way over here, like this KMX could probably just circle over here on the right hand side. So it doesn't mean when they go into weakening, you don't, keep watching them, it might mean that they get down here and you add to them. So it can actually help you just find stocks that are really strong on a pullback. Um, so it's just so many tools in that one. Yeah, well, I think we've gone over a lot of uh, the differences between the two. And I do want to say, Arthur, uh, thanks for kind of playing along and being our little non-member guinea pig here on the show, because I know it is a little frustrating after you're used to seeing all the things and all the tools that you're able to use at stock charts to have to go back and and to try to find out all the things that you can't access any longer. But uh, very, very good job, Arthur. Appreciate it. I'm, I'm sending Chip another check tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and Greg, well done as the member. Uh, you did a great job illustrating a lot of the cool features. Okay, great. All right, uh, so that is the end of this panel discussion. I do wanna thank uh, Arthur for joining us today. Um, Great job, and uh, I will definitely be uh, checking out your blogs. Everyone should be checking out your blog, uh, Arthur, and making sure that uh, they follow along with a lot of the things that you, you look at when you uh, analyze the market. Appreciate you both for joining us during the panel discussion. Thanks. Take care. All Thanks, right. Arthur. Okay, we are going to move on now to the 10 in 10. So let's, uh, I know the first symbol was NVIDIA. And we did talk about this a little bit, got an upgrade earlier, as uh, if you were with us earlier, you know that uh, Greg talked about. But let me show you on the chart what it is looking at or looking like currently. Here you can see NVIDIA making a big move up. It's been, you know, nice up uptrend. If I was looking only at the price chart, I'd say, hey, things are really starting to perk up here. I might be interested in buying it. I think I'd wait a little bit. And the reason I, I do like the volume coming in, I like the fact that the 20 has crossed back over the 50. So we're getting that golden cross. There are definitely positives here. What I'm most concerned about with NVIDIA 
is that it's kind of following the overall group. It's just that the semis are coming up and that's why NVIDIA is coming up. We're not seeing a lot of relative strength. Uh, when we talk about some of the, the semis that have shown a lot of relative strength, we talk about IPHI, we can talk about uh, AMD, um, to a lesser extent, a stock like Applied Materials, AMAT, which is at about a 10 month relative high now. Uh, those are some of the, the names that come to mind. There are plenty of others. NVIDIA is not really in that camp. On a relative basis, I'm not seeing still a whole lot of money coming into the stock relative to the semiconductor peers. So for that reason, I would not get into NVIDIA. I think it's still got some more work to do. I like what's going on here. I think the chart is getting more constructive, but I don't see enough relative strength. I'd stick with the leaders for now. Okay, uh, TMO. TMO, is that Thermo? Thermo Fisher, yeah, Thermo Fisher. Uh, really like the breakout here, and I like this group. Medical equipment, when you look down here at the bottom, broke out to a 52-week relative high versus the S&P 500 in June. So that would be one thing I certainly would be focused in on if I was annotating, is that with this stock, you know that you're in a group that at least recently broke to a 52-week relative high. You can see the absolute move here. You also can see on the breakout of the stock right there, as it's making this move up, look at the volume coming in. This is a, an increase in volume suggesting perhaps some um, accumulation of the stock. And so for that reason, I actually like these pullbacks. So when you get a stock like this that is struggling on a short-term basis, uh, you know, five or six days down while the S&P is setting highs, that, of course, is going to show a little bit of relative weakness. But this is a stock that has been leading. I think the two key areas on this stock are at about 282 and maybe about 294. Uh, I would be building a position. If you like the stock, I think that's a zone where I would be uh, adding to TMO. Yeah, I, I have to agree with you. I like that one on a pullback for sure. Uh, CDNA. It's not a ticker for Canada. Yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe you were throwing it in there on me. <laughs> um, yeah, Care DX, uh, nice volume here as it comes back up, makes a breakout. I've talked about this one recently. I think this is one of the better stocks within the healthcare providers group. The relative strength has been there. The problem with the stock struggling to make the breakout and stick is that the money in the group overall has not been very strong. But that seems to be changing today. We're actually moving to about a three-month relative high on healthcare providers with the bounce that we're seeing today. And I think that that bodes very well for a stock like this that's leading that group. So we did open up higher today uh, uh, with a, a new absolute breakout. But I think on any pullback now to that rising 20-day moving average, I would be a buyer. I think the group's starting to gain some, some steam, some relative steam. And this has been one of the best stocks. So I, I'm a fan. CDNA looks good to me. There's a small little company called Boeing that somebody would like to check out today. Yeah, Boeing, I've not been as big a fan. Let's see if anything's changed. I know that the uh, 360 level is pretty big, and we are right up against that now, trading at 358 and change. And the reason I say 360, it's just been a pivot area where we've either been able to get through or we have reversed. And so when you look at this chart, you can see starting in December, a top multiple tops in January before we broke, broke out. And when we come down, look at where we hold as support. Then we finally break down on increasing volume. And then we struggle to get through. Finally, we get back through on big volume and then right back down, we didn't hold it. And now we're coming back up and testing from underneath. So 360 has kind of been one of those uh, uh, centers of the universe, of the Boeing universe. So that's something I would pay particular attention to. You can also see the moving averages are right here near the 360 level. But probably the thing that bothers me being the most about Boeing is not so much the absolute chart, but it's the relative underperformance versus the aerospace group. Just uh, a week or, or so ago, we were near a 52-week relative low versus aerospace. And aerospace has been one of the weakest areas since March in the S&P 500. So you got a weak stock in a weak area. You know, if, if we get through 360, we saw that once, it didn't last. I just think that there, we need to see some relative strength here before I'd be convinced to jump back in. Boeing's a great company. I'm not trying to say it's not a great company and it will probably do fine down the road, but as a shorter, short to intermediate term uh, momentum trader, 
this one is not going to be one of my favorites at the present. So I would avoid it. Okay, Mr. Bully, you and I both bought houses in uh, the last year and we used a company called DocuSign, I'm guessing, because I know I did. I sure did. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, apparently not enough people are using it yet with this uh, movement to the side here and, and slightly lower. The this, relative, yeah, oh, check this. out also the weekly on this because it IPO'd just about a year ago. Okay, I'll pull that up in a second. Yeah, one of the problems I have, number one, it's in the software space. And when you look at the software space, it has been on fire. Um, software has been one of the best areas of the market in 2019. I might argue that it's been the best. Um, not just one of the best, but uh, renewable energy might uh, might be one that might top it. But the problem with the stock is that it's not one of the best stocks within the group. And so DocuSign on a relative basis is down near a 52 week low relative to its peers. So you can see the huge gap down here on heavy volume. We went back, filled that gap, haven't rolled over and gone to new lows yet, but in, a, in an area that has been so strong I am not going to be a fan if it's not one of the leaders. I really uh, have a thing for the relative strength and the best stocks within certain groups. So for that reason, I would pass on it. But let's pull up this weekly chart. Take a look and see. Yeah, I mean, we had the big move up, pulled back. We showed some strength. I, maybe this trend line, you know, it just needs to break. It seems like we're just consolidating after a big move up from December through March. Uh, but I'd have to see that trend line break. Maybe a move through 55, 56 would do it. Um, but that's that's how I would view it. Do you, do you see something different, Greg? No, I, I really like it. I think the biggest thing for me is the PPO on the weekly looks like it's just going to bounce off zero. That's an absolutely wonderful place to look for an entry. I like the fact that you can draw a trend line off the August high going down right down this uh, across the, the current peaks. And all of a sudden, if you get a breakout in that, I think it's it's off to the upside. And again, it, it was a new IPO stock. So it, it broke out, pulled back, it's consolidated ownership. I think it's probably ready for its next leg higher. Whether or not it can outperform the top 10 in, in software is a good question, but I like these when they get set up and just start to turn up, especially right near the zero level. Yeah, I, well, I definitely would agree with you that I, I think that um, anytime that my PPO is near the center line and it's been an uptrending stock, I make the assumption that it's going to continue until it proves me wrong. Yeah. So I do, I, I kind of agree with you on that. I'd like to see that relative strength start to build. And let me see, you know, money beginning to rotate because a lot of these Wall Street firms go out, they talk to these companies. And so they have an idea before you and I do, and they start getting positioned and we start seeing that relative strength. So for me, it's a little early, but I agree that based on that uh, weekly PPO, it's certainly a candidate that I would keep an eye on. Yeah. And uh, we're going to go look at another company. They do delivery a little bit different, UPS. Yeah, UPS uh, clearly um, been a, under a lot of pressure. Uh, relative to its peers, it's been doing well, but look what its peers have been doing. The <laughs> overall group has just been awful. So UPS um, is just part of a bad group. It's not actually been that bad on its own. Here's that relative weakness in the overall group. And for me, I think that probably would keep me out of the stock for now. Um, we're going to have some overhead resistance if we can get back up to that 108, 109 area. So I, I would just go ahead and hold off, I think, for now until um, we start to see more relative strength. Well, and I think if the transports turn up, that could help as well. So we'll, we'll keep watch. Okay, uh, got to pick it up a little bit. So let's go to Domo. D-O-M-O. All right, another software. Um, this one's starting to strengthen a little bit on a relative basis, but again, remains in this downtrend. So because of that, I would probably avoid, I think the first thing I'd need to see is you can see that gap up and failure and multiple failures now over the last month or so, 50 day coming down. Let's get a close over 3250 and then reevaluate. Cool, T-W-S-T. All right, TWST. All right, um, sideways for, since December. I mean, that's going to tell you something right there. Uh, the good news is that it's outperforming its biotech peers. The bad news is the biotech's just not been good relative to the S&P. And you can see continuing to weaken, which is, which is really odd. Uh, historically, July is a great month for biotechs. But I don't use that as my primary indicator for trying to get in or out of a, a group. 
that is more of a confirming type of a signal. And right now, we're not getting any kind of a technical breakout on anything biotech. Well, I shouldn't say anything. There are some biotech stocks, but the overall group um, has not yet shown that it's ready to make a move. Good volume trends, sideways consolidation. It's in the middle of this range. I, for me, it's, I just don't see anything here. Okay. Um, OHI. Right. So that's Omega, right? Omega Health? I think so. Yep. Omega Health. Um, and it's pulling back on a day when healthcare has been good. And uh, well, it's actually in the REIT space. So maybe it's uh, like a healthcare REIT kind of a thing. But anyhow, the, the group real estate has not been doing well at all today. So that might uh, have some influence. I'm trying to look for maybe um, a trend line or something to hang my hat on here. Maybe something like that. Uh, where we've got multiple um, tests along this trend line. We want to keep an eye on that. And then recent lows, uh, we could go there, or maybe even since trying to get it close to the trend line, these recent uh, support levels over the past two to three months. So I'm going to say 35 to 36 really needs to hold. Um, it is in the real estate space. I think the market goes higher. I'm looking for the aggressive areas. So for that reason, I would pass on it. Yeah. XBI is going to be our last one, which. XPI? XBI. BI. Okay. Yeah. yeah, this is, uh, again, what, what I was just talking about a minute ago on the biotechs. You know, we're holding the 20 day. I would say let's continue to do that. The market's been going up and breaking out to new highs. Look at where the biotechs have gone since the high in April, not following suit. So that's the biggest problem is we're just not seeing the, um, not seeing that, uh, that, relative strength. We're not keeping up with the S&P 500. Here was a breakout on volume in mid-June. We've pulled back and we've tested that. I would just watch this range, 84 to 89 and change. Let's see which way breaks first. If it breaks to the downside, given what's going on in the market, I, I would say, you know, you certainly want to, if, if I was in biotechs and especially the, this XBI, that's where I'd keep my stop. Yeah. All right. And that is the end of the 10 and 10. So there is a summary of what I just talked about. You can find those in the Market Watchers Live blog at the uh, end of the show or at the later in, after the show. And uh, when we get back, we're going to take a look at a final market update and uh, talking technically, followed by technical scanning. Stick around. Today's market volatility provides savvy traders and active investors with an abundance of profitable opportunities. At the Traders Expo Chicago, July 21st through 23rd, dozens of the most respected traders in the world, including Rick Santelli, John Najarian, Tom Sosnoff, Linda Rashke, and Ralph Acampora, will explain how they're adapting their strategies and share the specific trading opportunities they've identified in equities, commodities, forex, futures, and cryptocurrencies. Claim your free pass to join them at ChicagoTradersExpo.com. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, I thought maybe for this uh, update, we would first take a look at the sector summary. Um, you can see that here, uh, industrials, technology, financials, consumer discretionary, and communication services. The five aggressive groups are the five that are higher today as the S&P 500 tries to forge to new record highs and the Dow as well. Uh, to the downside, I was just talking about real estate. You can see it here, real estate down 1.5% today. It was trying to make a breakout yesterday and simply is pull, pulling back as I would expect sellers to be at that overhead resistance. So I'm not too surprised. One thing I wanted to mention though, is down at the bottom of this sector summary, you can see how you can pull up these different, uh, you can pull it up in perf chart, candle glance, RRG. What I did here is I pulled it up in the RRG on a daily format. And this compares all of the sectors to the spider or the S&P 500. And what you notice here on the daily chart, and this is what Julius talks about a lot, and he'll be coming on the show soon, is you want to look for these areas that are moving in a uh, northeaster, northeasterly fashion, and especially from improving into leading. And we're seeing that with the financials. We're seeing it with uh, uh, communication services. And then also what Julius mentions is when you get into the leading, you drop down into the weakening, and sometimes you go all the way back over into lagging. But one of the things he looks for is a, an area to turn back up from weakening into leading again. And that is what we're seeing with consumer discretionary. So three of these aggressive groups really showing uh, relative leadership on this daily RRG. I think that is uh, incredibly important, something to focus in on. And then, of course, just the overall market. The Dow Jones currently up 
177 points, still trying to hang on above 27,000 uh, to try to close there for the first time in history. The S&P trying to get above 3,000 for the first time in history. Right now, just a little bit below that level at 2,997. Okay, uh, we we're going to be back in here just in a minute or so. We first want to take a look at talking technically. I mentioned Julius de Kempenar and RRGs. Check this out. When you're looking at relative rotation graphs on stockcharts.com, you may have seen or noticed that the thickness of the tail or the width of the tail is not always the same. There is a, a, an additional indicator to be found there. The further away a security is from the benchmark, the thicker its tail. Closer to the benchmark, thinner tail. The reason for that is that the securities that are far away from the benchmark offer better opportunities to generate alpha. There is a bigger outperformance or underperformance to be gained from the stuff that's far away from the benchmark. Now, if we look at the RRG on the screen here, it shows you the S&P sectors with the S&P 500 as the benchmark. And let's look at XLE, which is very far away from the benchmark, and it has a thick tail inside the improving quadrant. If you look at XLRE, for example, or XLE, which are, which are much closer to the benchmark, they have much thinner tails. Now, what I want to show you is how the width or the thickness of that tail can change over time. I'm going to select XLE, which is in the top right corner here at the moment, and scroll it through history and monitor the thickness of that tail through time. The, third, the closer it comes to the benchmark, the thinner the tail gets. And then when it moves away again, the tail gets thicker again. So the thickness of the tail helps you to identify opportunities for out or underperformance. The thicker the tail, the better the odds for outperformance or underperformance as it's moving far away from the benchmark. Okay, welcome back. We're going to talk about scanning and I've just got a simple scan. We talked quite a bit about scooters today and one of the things that is unique to stock charts is the scooter ranking and you might have seen relative strength scanning on other systems. The one thing I find about the scooter is it's responsive. It moves relatively quick into the zone. I don't like it as much for an exit signal but I really like it for entry and um, trying to find things that are moving out of average performing into Above average performance is a nice area for me to, to focus on. So in this case, I've got the, the list set up for US only. If you were looking for Canada, obviously you would just put in the word. Uh, whoops, <laughs> it would be better if I typed that in the right place. Um, but up here, I'm gonna grab this. There we go. And I would just type in Canada if, if that's what you wanted to do. And then simple moving average, and you're gonna pick a volume level that's appropriate for Canada. It might This might be too high. Um, the scooter ranking greater than 70 and a scooter ranking less than 80. So I want to find something in between. So you have to make sure that it's above 70 and less than 80. If I put in or less than 80, it, it, you're starting to add difficulty. So and is an easier um, thing to work with. The next thing you can do is you can control it by ETF or not. So if I want, I can go down here and these are some of my choices, large, mid cap, small and US ETF, Canadian, uh, London, or the, uh, the India market. So you can go and look at any of these. And I think the most important thing to focus on with this is when you run the scan, uh, as an example, if we just want everything, we're just going to go like this and delete that out. And that's going to come up for us. So with that, it gives us 21 uh, things that are just in this scan area. So that's one way to do it. The second way to do it is to look for this particular line, which is sc scooter moving above 76 or the scooters moving above 78 or the scooters moving above 80. And by doing that, when I run the scan, it's going to work out so that I can um, I can find stocks that are all pushing higher and, and that can help work 
uh, for that. So I think it's quite a, a powerful way to go. As an example, here's whatever, a mayor source Bergen, and we can go and look at that chart. And I just find typically that this is a nice area to look at and see if they're going to break out. Now, this hasn't been above 75 for years. So the real question would be, can it start to push through? So maybe it goes on a watch list and you start to figure that out. So um, Mr. Boley um, is going to take over now and he's going to talk to you about uh, a different type of technical scanning. Yeah, I think what I'll do is um, I want to go through the predefined. I mean, it, I'm going to make it kind of easy, but if you go down here to the uh, scan area, your scans, you'll see these predefined scans. And so the first thing I would do if I wanted to go through here, and I'm a momentum trader. So one thing, obviously, I want to see are 52 week highs. Now you can see over here, 436 of them. So if I click on that number, I will be taken to this predefined scan list. And here are all the stocks. And you'd be looking at this saying, oh my gosh, I've got all these different pages and of stocks. How in the heck am I gonna go through all of these? Well, there's, there are ways to, to lower uh, the number of stocks that are in here. So what you can do is you can click here to edit the scan. Let's say I just wanted to look at technology stocks. Give me all the technology stocks that are breaking out to new highs. All right, so here, when you click on that, it gives you exactly what it's, you know, what it's pulling up here. Well, you can customize this, and I go down here under sectors and industries, and I can go down to technology, add it, and now when you scroll up here, you'll, say, you'll see, and the group is technology sector. So now it not only is that, does it have to be hitting a 52 week high, but it also has to be in the technology sector. So when I run this scan, well first check, always good idea to check syntax and you can see everything's fine. So now I click run scan and what you're gonna find is now I have 35. So I just took this list, this overwhelming list of 480 stocks or whatever, 430 stocks, whatever. And I just customized it a bit and I got down to the 35 stocks that I wanted to, to see. Now I can replace an existing chart list. So I have a few different uh, chart lists with scan results. I'm just gonna put it into other. And this rewrites. So if you wanna, if you're gonna, uh, if you don't mind rewriting, that was the choice. Otherwise you can add your, uh, to an existing chart list. You don't have to rewrite it. I rewrote it. So now the only thing in this chart list is going to be these um, stocks that I just added to here. All right, now I'm gonna go into one of these uh, lattice semiconductor and you know I like to use my relative charts. So I'm gonna push this chart style button. Now I've got my relative chart style. So now I can look at lattice and I see, yes, it's breaking out. Oh, and by the way, it's one of the best performing stocks in the semiconductor group. So now I say, well, yeah, I really like this. Now, how do I have to keep doing all of this throughout the entire chart list? And the answer is no. What you can do is down here at the bottom where it says chart list, apply the current chart style to all the charts in this chart list. So now I can apply my chart style to all and click okay. And now every chart in this scan results, if I go to the next one, it's gonna also be using uh, this relative strength. So it's just a really quick way of taking 52 week highs, um, downloading them, just the predefined scan, then further uh, breaking it down by the technology stocks, because that's what I'm really interested in. You heard Arthur, uh, Arthur talking earlier about the fact that technology and some other areas leading the market doing really well. I've mentioned uh, during the last market update that uh, technology, one of the areas leading the market. So if your momentum trader, these are the, this is one way to, to bring out all of these technology stocks. So I know every stock that I look at in this list is going to be a technology stock. Okay. So that's already been figured out. So when I'm looking at these, I can, I can zero in on a couple of things. Now, one thing that bothers me about this stock, LUNA, Luna Innovations, look at the volume. Many days, it's very light. Today, it's got 199,000, but that's a heavy volume day. I wouldn't trade it just because I don't like the light volume. So this is one that if you're looking at a view all, 10 per page, one thing you can do is go down here. Well, I'd have to go find Luna, uh, which let's see, it might be on page two. As I'm going through and looking for Luna, there it is. 
Um, I don't like it. See this little trash can? Boom, it's gone. I don't have it on my list anymore. Um, I mentioned uh, semiconductors and the leaders. One of them I mentioned was IPHI. Look at this stock, do, look what it's doing now on this breakout. If you ran this thing two days ago and you saw this breakout on heavy volume, we talked about it here on the show. You also would have pulled up and looked and see, seen that uh, IPHI is one of the best performing uh, semiconductor stocks. Catch it on this breakout and look what you've got. Stocks up another 8% the last two days. Um, so again, as a momentum trader, I'm just showing you how quickly you can go from 52 week highs and zero in on the areas of the market that you want. And then by using this relative strength uh, chart style, um, I can then further uh, go through the list and see what it is that I really uh, like and don't like about these different charts. So let's just randomly go to the last page here and we'll go through a few of these. First one is uh, Viavi Solutions. Stock's breaking out, looks good, relative strength. Hasn't quite gotten a breakout versus the telecom group, but we are strengthening. So I like that. Volume is fine. We got a nice uptrend in play. I actually, off of this uptrend, I'm looking at what looks to me like a cup. Handle back to the 20-day moving average and a breakout. This cup, 1380 down to 1180 that's $2. This one measures up to about 1580 I would be looking for that as a target, almost another 10% from where we are now. Best entry would be a pullback to test gap support and price support. There was your prior price resistance. We break out, 1375 or so would be price support. It also is gap support, and it also is the 20-day moving average. So would I buy at 1440? No, but if it's in my chart list and I see it down one day and I can get it close to that 1375, then yeah, it starts to make a little bit more sense. VeriSign, another big breakout here on VeriSign. It has been a great stock. Um, with it amongst its peers. Volume's been strong on this last push to the upside. I think VeriSign's a great candidate. Workday, we were talking earlier about software and some software stocks not really showing relative strength. Well, here's Workday making a breakout to a 52 week high, and it has been one of the best performers within software. Although the last six months or so, I'd say it's just kind of going along for the ride, which isn't that bad when you're in one of the best uh, areas of the market. So I think Workday looking pretty good there. Yeah, exactly. Um, what's that? Exactly. It, I mean, it's been such a strong group. Just going along for the ride has been wonderful. So Yeah, and, and you could almost make a living if you're a trader. You could almost make a living trading software stocks. Oh, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. especially right now. Yeah. I mean, the, the rotation, though, you do get some rotation within the group. And as you see a, a stock, you know, some of the smaller names starting to make breakouts, uh, breaking trend lines like you, you use, um, Greg, on your, your PPOs. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can look at it, but outperforming is outperforming. Yeah. Um, and that you really can't argue. I mean, when that relative strength line is going up, that is normally a good thing. If you want to outperform the stock market, for me, it's been one of the most eye-opening uh, technical things that I've found since I've been using stock charts is using these relative charts. Yeah. Um, but anyway, there you got WorldPay. WorldPay making a breakout to the upside. Um, and you can see, again, software moving up. World pay on a relative basis pulls, has pulled back, but it's mostly been while it's consolidating. There's nothing wrong on the chart. Um, I would expect actually for it to pick back up again on a relative basis. And I think I might have had one more down here. Zendesk, uh, shocking, another uh, software stock, which had been a leader for quite a while. Now, like Workday, going along for the ride, just simply going sideways, which again, not a bad thing as it breaks out to a new 52-week high. So. You know, I guess in, in summary here, looking at these, uh, you know, the scans, you can take a predefined scan and still customize it to find what it is that you're looking for. So as long as you, you know, can come up with ideas and can figure out what it is that you want to see, you can go back and adjust, um, you know, these different scans. So, you know, I could get rid of this technology. I'll just show you one more thing before we go into our poll and wrap up the show. But if I get rid of technology and just go down here, healthcare is having a great day. Now, I don't expect too many healthcare stocks are breaking to 52 week highs, but by simply adding it, you can see it up here. Check the syntax, run the scan. And how many do we have? 20. So you got 20 of those. And if you want to separate it by industry, let's say medical equipment is what you really like, you could further go back into that sample or into that scan and then zero down into medical equipment stocks 
and it would have brought these up for you. What about eight of them um, sorted in scooter order and then by um, medical equipment. And you can see, actually, let me uh, sort it the other way first. And then by industry group now under medical equipment, you can see there's the highest ranked scooter score among medical equipment stocks, NVCR. And here's the chart. Last chart will show and then we'll wrap up. But it's another stock breaking out. And again, if you did this every day, if this was part of your trading strategy, you would have seen this stock breaking out uh, two weeks ago at $62. It's almost 70 now. So another 10% plus to the upside since it made its breakout. So anyway, just giving you some ideas. I think uh, Greg sh shared some great ones there with you as well on how we can use the scan engine here at Stock Charts to quickly, incredibly quickly, zero in on some trading opportunities. Pretty impressive uh, feature. All right, uh, Greg, um, well, we got a couple minutes. I think maybe we'll go into that poll, um, which talks about you know the Dow hitting 27,000, the S&P hitting 3,000. Does the market have the power to move higher here from here? How would you answer the question? You know, what, one of the things I use the scan engine for is just to go and find out how many PPOs are in an uptrend, how many are above zero. I mean, it's like 130 or above zero out of the industry groups. It's just crazy. So they're rising, they're above zero. You know, normally for the market to fall precipitously, you kind of need a whole bunch of sectors to stop performing. And then you need them all to kind of be rolling over. You know, we've got a few things like commodities struggling, but we don't have any real sign of breadth weakness it's so vast and the scan engine points me to that every week i mean i just can't imagine that this is uh you, you know that we don't go higher from here so. yeah you don't see a top here yeah i i agree with you i would have absolutely answer this question yes anybody who read my chart watchers article last week i mean it may sound outrageous the s p 500 to 4,000 within two years but the charts i showed earlier and that i've been showing on market watchers live Yes, we've had a good run, but we've had a good run without money rotating from treasuries. We've had a good run without transports supporting this move to the upside with um, a Fed continuing, well, actually moving back uh, to becoming more dovish again, which aligns with the central bankers around the globe. Everyone is, is printing money. Uh, there's no inflation at this point to be worried about. Obviously, the Fed will keep a close eye on that. And so you know, moderate growth in a very low interest rate environment is, I think it's nirvana for the market. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm not asking you to, to predict 4,000 on the S&P 500, uh, Greg, but where do you think we could go? I mean, do you have any targets? You know, I don't have any targets, but I will say that it's it's common to get 25% moves and then the market kind of needs to check itself. So it wouldn't surprise me that we get some sort of a breakout. Let's whatever, just pick 3250 or something like that. And then we kind of pause or or need whatever, a five or a 10% pullback, something like that. But Right now, the breadth is fine. We don't have any real reasons to pull back. I will say that the market's hitting new highs, even though we haven't solved China, India, Japan, or Europe's trading um, agreements. So, you know, we've got a lot of opportunity for upside still from here. Um, yeah, I would 100% agree with you. I think we've got possibility of pullbacks along the way, like you mentioned, but I, I see the market going higher. Uh, we do have the summer doldrums to worry about as well a little bit, but we'll we'll take it one day at a time here. I do want to thank all of you for being with us today. Special shout out to Arthur Hill and to Greg for joining me today on the, the panel. Uh, please remember to complete the survey as you exit. Uh, as a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Thursday afternoon, everybody. See you tomorrow. Happy trading. <music>